on hymns like this can be very helpful to us in our personal fellowship with the Lord. I don't know how often um, we use the hymns uh, like this in our personal times with the Lord. In previous times with you here, we've actually had some sessions to em emphasize this matter. But this particular hymn, um, it, it, uh, it has some phrases that uh, actually I, I'm thinking we'll see how the Lord leads, whether at the very end, after my speaking, we'll sing this again, and hopefully this will be even more meaningful. Because what we're talking about, <clears throat> you, you know, the, the, our overall talk, topic is making ourselves ready for the Lord's coming. And, and we talked about last night the first thing, the most important thing. What, what is that? Love. That's it. You, you, you. Well, when you can summarize a message with one word, that, that means you got it. Thank you. Love. That's the most important thing. Today, we emphasize another word. Life. Life. Actually, not just life. Growing in life. Actually, not just growing in life, but growing in life unto maturity. Someone, some have to grow to maturity. Eventually, do you know what? Your destiny is to grow to maturity. Like, everybody is going to grow to maturity. But there's this thing in the, in the Bible called the first fruits, which just, it's a matter of time. Some, some ripen first, or a little, a little earlier. And some ripen three and a half years earlier. The Lord's looking for those. You know, when you go to, when you go to uh, if you're in an orchard or even in your garden, in your backyard, uh, you're growing fruit. Uh, or, you know, anyway, or vegetables. You, 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 you don't necessarily look for the biggest one. You look for the ripest one. The one that has grown to maturity because they're ready and 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 that's what the Lord's looking for among his people and eventually just give time a little more time maybe just three and a half years more and and everybody will grow or even a thousand years more but eventually everybody will grow and the Lord will enjoy yeah but <clears throat> Not only to escape something negative, I think also to please him. Wouldn't you just want to be ripe a little bit earlier? Knowing that the Lord is, oh, 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 not ready yet. Oh, oh, oh. We say, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. <laughs> then, then what? Oh, deepen all thy work, oh, master. Lord, Lord, deepen. And then it says something here about faster, right? Strengthen every downward root. We're going to talk about roots in a little while. Only do thou ripen faster. Amen. You know, that's, that's, that's a good prayer. Lord, <clears throat> and actually, I don't, want us, I don't want anyone here, any of us, to be self-analytical. But wherever we're at, it's a good prayer to say, Lord, ripen faster yeah. in me. I don't know where I'm at, but I know I'm not ready. I think that's an honest prayer. Then you say, Lord, ripen faster. Do you think, do you think that he'll look at you and say, nah, nah, not, not you. I don't, think he, I don't think he would turn anyone away that would say, Lord, <clears throat> you know me better than anyone. I'm not like anything. From the beginning till now, I give you all sorts of trouble. I'm not faithful. But Lord, right now, I'm praying this prayer, and I mean it. Grow in me. Ripen faster. Do you, do you think he will say, no, you've been too naughty? Do you think he would say that? I don't think he would say that. I think he'd just be so happy. So happy. He also would know, actually, you're going to still be naughty. But 
I'll take you at your word, and I'll do something. Actually, I'll bring you something to help you ripen faster. Now that you mention it, I've been waiting to bring certain things to you to help you ripen faster. So here we go. So we're going to talk about that today in this, in this, in this message. Uh, and I, I love um, verse 3. Let me grow by sun and shower. By sun and shower. Sometimes we like the sun. We don't like the shower. But here it's saying, Lord, let me grow, whether it's sunny or cloudy, whether it's, it's so pleasant or kind of cloudy and dark and stormy. I still want to grow. I still want to grow. Every moment, water me. And, and, and <laughs> verse 5 has been my prayer for several months now, in, into last year, into last year. Let me then be always growing, never, never standing still. This has been my prayer. Lord, let me please be never standing still. I, I don't know how far I have come. I know I've come somewhere because I know I'm not where I was. But Lord, you know this failure, that unfaithfulness, this thing, that thing. I'm not where I should be, Lord. But wherever I am, Lord, never, never standing still. Listening, listening, learning, and better knowing thee and thy most blessed will. Till I win the glorious race, daily let me grow in grace. So many things here can be our prayer. But as I said, I trust this may be even more meaningful to us that if we sing a little later, there'll be even much more feeling. And I want to encourage you, if, if we get there, and even if we don't get there, you can sing this privately. But when you come to a line that, that means something to you at the moment, you don't have to keep singing. Let everybody else keep singing and just pray it. Just pray it. Don't wait until, don't, even don't wait until you finish that stanza, that verse. Just right there, there's something, it may say, uh, therefore, therefore speed me, Lord Jesus, speed me in the race. Can you do that? Can you do that? I'm so slow. I've, I've delayed you so long. But right now, Lord, right now, you, 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 you've done something in me. You've spoken to me. Lord, remove the, the weeds. Remove the things, the obstacles. Remove the stones. Remove the thorns. And Lord, speed me in the race. And, and so you, you just convert it to prayer on the spot. Don't, don't wait. Of course, if you're praying by yourself, that is what I mean, these, these kind of hymns. If you, ha, have you never woken up with a hymn? Do you wake up with a hymn? I take that as the Lord's calling me into his, the fellowship of his son. He's calling. You know, sometimes we wake up and we're, oh, Lord, you know, like we're, we're so far and we got to cut. You know, to get back, you know, to turn the whole thing, to quiet the thoughts. But sometimes, even as soon as you wake up, there's a tune in your heart. It could be that we sang it last night, you were in a meeting, it could be you were listening to a recording, or it could be you just remember because it was in you since you were a teenager. And the Lord just brings it, you know, brings it back. And I like to just sing that. I like to sing that. That's why, saints, it's, it's, it's helpful to know the hymns. It's helpful to know the numbers of the hymns. So you don't have to be, where is that? And, and, you, and you lost the spirit. By the time you find it, there's no spirit or anointing left. But, but if, you know, or, or what you could do is follow our, 
the, the pattern of our beloved brother, Dick Taylor. I was with Dick. I think I told you this story one time. I was with Dick in Sydney one time. And we're in a, a special fellowship. It wasn't a, a, a conference meeting, but it was during the conference, but a special fellowship. And then I'm sitting next to him, and he calls out, can we sing? Listen. And so everybody turns to it. And, uh, and uh, I noticed he didn't have a hymn book, a hymn book with him. Well, he didn't open his hymn book. And, but he's singing. But I know he's singing the, not the right words. <laughs> so I... So... So I did, I did like, you know, like this. He said, oh, that's okay. I just make up my own words. <laughs> so, and he's the one who called the hymn. But, but, and he's just in John, I don't know. I mean, that made, the, the words made sense that he was singing, but he just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't word for word what it was there. And, and he just, that didn't bother him. So I just ain't never met anybody who enjoys the Lord as much as Brother Dick Taylor. Sorry if some of you don't know him. Most of you know him, right? You know, who he, you know Brother Dick. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, but, but don't be frustrated. And, but if you know the hymns, then, then you could just sing. And as soon as anything touches you, don't be bound by the concept, I have to finish singing before I can pray. I, because we sing, then we pray. And that's like the, you know, when you're in a corporate meeting, it'd be a little confusing if all of a sudden everybody's praying, you know, and, and yeah. And in Corinthians says, let all things be done decently and in order, right? That's 1 Corinthians 14. But when you're by yourself, there are no rules. Actually, there is a rule. The rule is follow the Spirit. And so the Spirit leads you. First, he brings a hymn. And then as you're singing, he interrupts you with anointing. You should just, he's the one leading, so just follow him to convert that spirit that's touching you into words. And it's very interesting, when you pray those words, you get more spirit. Actually, you get light. You get light. Sometimes you have to start confessing. You haven't even opened the Bible yet. But you're already singing, praying, confessing. And so he, he just leads us in, in that way. Actually, this is the way to deepen the roots. To deepen the roots. Okay. Um, in your outline, I hope we, we all have the, the, the outline. The first, well, the title is Making Ourselves Ready for the Lord's Coming by Growing in Life Unto Maturity. By Growing in Life Unto Maturity. So the key word Yesterday, love. Keyword today, life. But again, not just life, because we have life. Growing in life. But not just growing in life. You, we've all been growing in life. Growing in life unto maturity. But, but that's all wrapped up in life. Right? <clears throat> and uh, the first verse in the scripture reading is Hebrews 6.1. Hebrews 6.1. And that verse, uh, <clears throat> I'll read it to you. It says, Therefore, leaving the word of the beginning of Christ, let us be brought on to maturity. Amen. Let us be brought on to maturity. Can we say that together? Let us be brought on to maturity. Sisters, could you declare that? Brothers, Let us be brought on to the church. so we are talking about making ourselves ready. And, and remember, the basis for the title is Revelation 19.7. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, for behold, the wife has made herself ready. And it does say, she made herself ready. It does say that. She made herself ready, which, which means you, you and I, we bear responsibility. We, we have to make ourselves ready. But the Lord is wonderful, and the Bible is wonderful, because that's not the only verse in the Bible. Because then you have this verse. And this verse says, let us, what? Be brought 
on to maturity. That verse does not say, grow. I said, grow. That verse doesn't say that. That verse says what? Let us be brought on to maturity. What is that? That's, that's, come on, be, come on. be brought on, be brought on. It's a little struggle at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but that's us. We say, and sometimes we feel, oh, I can't grow. I just can't. Look at me. Look at my past. And then look at me. But this verse not say, does not say, let us look at you. Let us look at your past. It says, let us be brought on. It doesn't even say, go on. You know, sometimes we encourage each other, brother, go on. And we go, <laughs> amen. <laughs> right? We, but inside, there's a lot of thoughts. Like, <laughs> if you, you probably don't know me. Maybe you forgot or you just don't know me that well. But me, you know, whenever we talk about overcomers, yep, that's me. Whenever we talk about, you know, the bride, the kingdom, okay, okay, not me. We listen nicely, quietly, you know, but not me. Uh, saints, I, I just hope we touched, we touched the word. There are verses like this. It says, let us be brought on. Amen. That means if you allow yourself, that's our cooperation. Let. Just, just let. Don't, don't, don't struggle. And don't be, don't be like that woman in Luke, bent double. Do, do you know that story? That there's, a, there's this woman, the Lord touches her. She, they, she comes to the Lord. She's, what is bent double? You know, it says it in your Bible. Did you read this? You, you're, you know this, right? But this is bent, and maybe it's just bent double. So, you know, there, this is an infirmity. You know, I have a, I have a, a relative that she has... So, some, something with her spine. And, and she has, through the years, she, she's like this. And, and she, she's actually going to have an operation soon. So she's bent. Thank the Lord she's not bent double. But there is such a condition. And so this woman was bent double. Okay, if you're bent double, what do you see? Either the ground or yourself. That's, that's the entire vista and some of us maybe even here we're spiritually bent double we're talking in the meetings about oh the lord's purpose the lord's coming and all we see is ourselves so we we don't have hope all we see is our situation oh my problems my this my that and i don't even know why i came this morning Sometimes the enemy lies to us and we get to that point. Or we see the earth, the world, like we were talking last night. And even down there, it's attracting and pleasant. And we still love the world. But whatever it is, there is such a verse that says what? Let us be brought on to maturity. Not just brought on. This is like all the way? You might think, okay, I can, I can go on, but mature? Me? You just feel like, never, that's never going to happen. Actually, you don't believe the Bible then. Because according to the Bible, we, you know, the Lord will come one day to harvest his people. So everyone is going to be mature. It's just a matter of time. So if you say, oh, never, no, then 
You have to read the Bible again and believe the Bible. <clears throat> Roman 1, the outline. In his epistle, James uses the illustration of a farmer awaiting with long suffering the precious fruit of the earth. James 5, 7. Therefore, I'll, I'll read this to you. Therefore, be long suffering, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer eagerly awaits the precious fruit of the earth, exercising long suffering over it until it receives the early and late rain. And it says here, A, the Lord Jesus is actually the real farmer, the unique farmer. And then, and, and the verse there is Matthew 13, 3. Behold, the sower went out to sow. I'll come back to this. Notice, that's, that's Matthew. That's the first book in the New Testament. The Lord's a farmer. Now, Revelation. Look at, look at B. Let's read B together. While we are awaiting with long suffering. <laughs> Revelation 14 are the verses here. <clears throat> In Revelation 14, the Lord is standing on Mount Zion with 144,000. And it says, these are the first fruit. First fruit. That's, that's verse 4. But then there's verses 14 and 15. 14 says, and I saw and behold, there was a white cloud, and on the cloud, one like the Son of Man sitting, having a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Re remember we said last night, signs. Don't think that when you see the Lord Jesus, he's going to have the sword, you know. These are signs. A sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, send forth, your, send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. So with these verses, I want to point this out. From the beginning of the New Testament to the end of the New Testament, the Lord Jesus is a farmer. You know, this is, to me, very interesting. When he came, he gave a parable. You know these parables? The sower goes out to sow. This is, I mean, I think even our children know this parable. And there are how many different kinds of soil? Who knows? Four. Four kinds of soil. The first one is what? It's hard. It's the wayside. So, I mean, it's not in the middle of the field. It's at the edges. And why, why is it? It's hardened because that's where people walk. And, and, but do you know what? Jesus, I don't know why he wastes his time, but he does. He sows seed there. If I, if I were God, I think I would know ahead of time that nothing's going to grow there. So why would you bother? But our God sometimes is not the way we naturally think. So I would say, uh, excuse me, Lord, you're wasting. He, he would be quiet. I know what I'm doing. But it's hard. Why? Why? Because of the traffic of the world. And then birds come and take the seed away. And that's what happens with us. That's a picture of our heart, my heart, your heart. And especially, oh my, especially with these guys, these things, you could be, you know, it used to be, it used to be that, that, all the news, all the everything, what, you know, did the Mariners win? You know, all it, you know Mariners? In this part, you know, Mariners? Oh, Seahawks, Seahawks, Seahawks. Um, you know, you wouldn't know until after the meeting. Now, instant. Oh, and you go, Seahawks are leading. You go, amen. You could be right in the meeting. You know what that is? That's Matthew 13. The Lord sows seed. 
they're just trampling, there's trampling. And so the, the birds come, that's, you know, Satan, that shows Satan's kingdom. They come and take the weight, and then and they say, oh, how was the meeting? <laughs> good. All the meetings are good, good, good. How's it about? What is it about? Uh, God? <laughs> Christ? And you're safe if you say, oh, God's economy. It almost sounds like you were paying attention. But this God, you don't, you just do not remember. See, it's gone. And even you were touched with something, the impression's gone. Because right after the meeting, you, you turn on, you open, you think, and then all the feeds, all the this, all of that, news, and then the gossip. And so on the way home, instead of, how's the meeting, dear? It's, it's do you know who's getting married? And it's, it's gone. And then there's another soil. What? Rocks. And then something comes up. Something comes up. And, and right away. So, oh, it's so exciting. But then, why? The sun comes up. And it says, because it had no depth of earth. Then it wilted. Now, <clears throat> shouldn't the sun help your growth? But if you don't have depth of earth, the sun causes you to wilt. And in, in Matthew 13, you should read, just keep reading. You don't have to, this is another one where you don't have to figure out the sign. The Lord just explains it. And he says, affliction arises because of the word, which means opposition. So the opposition is the sun. Now, you could see that when the opposition rises up, you wilt, someone wilts. But the opposition is the sun, which means what? The opposition, is affliction, is supposed to help you grow. If you had depth of earth, that means if you had roots, the affliction, the problems, the things that are against us, rather than causing us to wilt, will cause us to grow. So the problem is not the sun. The problem is no depth, no roots, no roots. And then there's another soil. What's that? Thorns. This is very, very deceptive because they grow and you grow, and you keep growing, but eventually choke, because you let something grow alongside, and you didn't realize, and you tolerated something. And this could be anything. I know this very much. I, I really expose myself a little. I really enjoy sports. I enjoy, I enjoy participatory sports although I cannot participate as much as when I was younger. I enjoy spectator sports. I got my teams. My teams are not the Seahawks and definitely not the Mariners. <clears throat> although I like to see the Mariners do well. I'm happy they were in the playoffs. <clears throat> I have another team. And so I, I know what it's like, even that, being occupying. I, I know what that's like. I know what that's like. <clears throat> and when I was, a, actually, I had an experience with this even when I, was a, when I was a young boy, but in the Lord. I was 13. I was on a basketball team. 14, 13, 14. I was on a basketball team. <clears throat> and my ankles, I think three times I busted this ankle, two times I busted this ankle. Sprains, bad sprains. And we played, you know, in the season, and had to sit out. Oh, what a suffering. What a suffering. Did you do this playing sports? That. I understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, oh, standing, you know, sitting there and watching my team, and then if they're losing, you know, you always feel, huh, if I were in the game, you know, you're always so prideful. If I were, then, you know, and, and, and getting angry, and then I get angry. I'm not angry at my team. I'm actually angry eventually at God because he let that happen. And what, you know, 
eventually we blame everything on God. But I was upset. And then, I, and then it happened another time. I think it was the third time. And uh, I was there on the side in the gym. Actually, again, I was in the denomination. And, and our chapel, we had a gymnasium attached to the chapel. And I was telling some of the brothers. Actually, we, oh, Brother Peter, we had hundreds of children and young people. Saved, actually. Through that little gymnasium. I'm not promoting leaven. Please do not misunderstand. But we had the gospel. That's all we had. And we were faithful to share the gospel. And we were like a little beacon in that dark area in New York City, in a Hispanic, mostly Hispanic and, and African-American community. So <clears throat> it, was, it was the only positive thing <laughs> in that neighborhood, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in the 60s and 70s. And so <clears throat> anyway, I was there in that gym. And I was the game, and I'm in dinner, and I had a, a, something, a thought came in my heart. You love that little ball more than me. And it was so, it was, it wasn't a voice. Don't misunderstand me. I didn't hear the voices, okay? It was like, oh, you know, it wasn't like that. But something in my heart. I already, I was only 13 or 14, but I already knew the Lord speaking. I already knew the Lord speaking. And, and it was very clear. You love that ball more than me. And I, and I remember saying, no, I don't. And, and the Lord said, yes, you do. And I said, I don't. And I, was, I was like angry with the Lord over this. <clears throat> anyway, then I recovered and happened again. And the Lord spoke again. The Lord spoke to me again. And this time, I said, Lord, this is true. But never again. This is true. Amen. But never again. I will never again allow sports to occupy me, to be the first place in my life. So from then till now, I can throw it down and pick it up again. And I admit, I enjoy. I enjoy watching, but it doesn't take away from my church life, fellowship with the Lord. I, I, can, I can actually do that with him at times. But that's from a boy. I made a decision. Never again. And the Lord worked that in me till today. And I was 13, 14 maybe, the, 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 the most. I could not be that way with everything. But if you don't have experiences like that, eventually the thorns choke the growth. And that's why you can have someone like Demas, who even continues, grows, matures to the point of being Paul's co-worker. But something was never dealt with. I don't know Demas' situation, but we have maybe a based on our experience, a little insight. There, there must have been something not dealt with in our brother. We don't judge him. We don't have the ground to judge him, nor anyone, because I might be Demas number two. I'm here today. It doesn't guarantee I'm here tomorrow. I'm here this year. It doesn't guarantee. I don't even know you invite me back after this, but one day, where, where's Brother Ricky? Wouldn't it be a shame? Wouldn't it be a shame? If you, Brother Jim, where's Brother Ricky? And he says, actually, Brother Ricky has abandoned us. He abandoned us, having loved the present age. So, oh, our love and life. We need dealings in life. To love is the basis. And the growth in life is the development. Out of that love, we say, Lord, grow in me. To maturity. Bring me on to maturity. Of course, the fourth soil is the good ground. And everything, things grow 30-fold, 
60 fold, 100 fold. But it's so interesting. I, I'm, just, I'm just refreshed in this thought. This is a picture of God's purpose and economy. And how does he come? As a seed. I didn't come ready. I thought about this when I sat down here. I said, I should have brought a seed. A seed. You know, a seed. A seed is God's economy. What kind of God do we have? That he could, like, wrap up his purpose in this picture of a seed. You know, in uh, Romans 4, I think it's 17, it says, talking about Abraham, that he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls the things not being as being. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> many of the Lord's children appreciate that God calls things not being as being. And, 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 and pray to that God. Pray to the God of power. Pray to the God of miracles. But in the Bible, God portrays himself much more as the God who gives life to the dead. Now, he is. He is the one who calls things not being as being. And we experience this. We experience this actually quite a bit. But in the Bible, much more, he's the one who gives life. Even in Genesis 1, you know, you might think Genesis 1, creation, right? Genesis 1. He <laughs> let there be light, and there's light. And he calls the, 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 the land out of the sea. Oh, spectacular. But the rest of the chapter is life, 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 life. Different levels of life, different progressions of life, different developments of life until you have what? Man, the life of man in the image of that life, God. So the calling things not being as being are actually just to set the stage, just to have a, 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 a place, a setting for life. Life is the center. Life is the center. And so, in the New Testament, when he comes, he does not come as the God of power. Yes, yes. He healed this one. He healed that one. He healed the other one. How many of those were with him at the end? How many of those were in the 120? We know Mayor, you know, the one he cast out the demons. She loved him. But how many of the others were with him? And Peter was there. That's just because the Lord attracted him. John and James were there because the Lord called them. Sure, sure, Lazarus. Right? He was raised from the dead. But he died again. Much more, the Lord is the life giver than the God of power. So when he comes... He comes as a seed. So he's the farmer, and he's also the seed. <laughs> Farmers don't sow themselves, but he does. And so he sows himself into our heart. And then in 1 Peter, it says that having been regenerated out of incorruptible seed by the living and abiding word of God, so the word of God is a seed to be sown into the hearts. Then in, in the epistles, we see Paul, I have planted, Paulus watered, God gave the growth. It talks about growing, growing, growing. We see the development. Finally, in Revelation, there's the harvest. But before the harvest, first fruit. First fruit. The Lord's looking among his people who will ripen faster? And, and I, I would just say, don't you have the desire? Lord, if it's possible, I'd like to ripen faster. Amen. Not just to escape. Although, although, you know, in Luke it says, 
you should, you should beseech so that you can prevail to escape what's coming, the tribulation. Those three and a half years will be so intense. That used to be my primary motivation when I was younger. That was to escape. I, I, want, to, I, I want to grow. <laughs> and be, I want to be ready. So self-centered. Today, I can tell you, it's not that. It's, Lord, I don't know if I'll be the first fruit, but Lord, you must have first fruit. So I like to help the saints grow, even if I don't make it. I'd like you to get that. I'd, of course I'd like to be in the number. That's not the important thing. The important thing is, Lord, that you be satisfied, that you be pleased. So grow. Grow in me. Grow in them. Grow in everybody. Amen. You know, there's a, in, in the scripture reading, I think we have this verse, Colossians 4.12. I don't know if you've paid attention to this verse before. This is about Epaphras. Do you know this person, Epaphras? <laughs> we, we just don't pay attention. Epaphras. It says Epaphras, Epaphras, E P A. P-H-R-A-S, Epaphras, who is one of you. That means he was a brother in the church in Colossae. A slave of Christ Jesus greets you. So he's from the church in Colossae, but he was with Paul. <clears throat> Always struggling on your behalf in prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So here's a brother from Colossae. And now he's with Paul, but he can't stop thinking of the saints in his locality. When you're away from the saints in your locality, do you still struggle for them? Or out of sight, out of mind? <laughs> Do you pray for the saints in your place? Oh, Lord. And he says, struggling in prayer. Struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature. So he's with Paul. He's with Paul. But he can't help but pray, oh, Lord. Lord, grow in the saints in my locality. Grow in Colossae. Grow in Brother Eric. Grow in Brother Jim. Grow. So he... he this must be. Don't you think this was occurring? He's with Paul, but they're praying. And, and, and now uh, uh, Paul has a burden to write a letter. So maybe they were prayed for this letter. Lord, that this letter would, would accomplish what you want. Strengthen Brother Paul. Give Paul, Brother Paul the wisdom. He may have said, brothers, I'm, I'm burdened to write something to the saints. Oh, now... May, may, I don't know, maybe it even, the burden even came because of praying with Epaphras. So, but the point is this, we should be burdened and pray, Lord, ripen faster in me. But we should also be concerned for all the other saints around us. Ripen faster, ripen faster in all the young people. You know the way I pray these days? Lord, you're a sevenfold intensified spirit, right? You know, we don't believe this. We don't, and if we believe this, we don't often pray this. We don't apply this. I just believe that you can go seven times faster today than you ever, ever could. So you should be able to, and there are brothers like this among us, here and there. Their growth in life was, whew. you know, Brother Nee said this about Brother Lee. His growth in life is flying. Why do we think, wow, as if that's something so abnormal? Do we not have the sevenfold spirit today? You know, I, I actually was talking to Brother Ed about this, Brother Ed Marks. Uh, Brother Ed, I don't know. I just have a thought that the saints, not saints, the, the, the Christians, but including us, the saints, many of us, have a concept that Revelation, the book of Revelations for the future. Now, maybe that was true at one time, but not today. And actually, 
It was never true. Because when John wrote this, when John wrote this, we were already in the, in the stage of intensification. Because he saw the seven spirits, did he not? So already from Revelation 1, the seven lamps of fire are burning before the throne. And the order of the triune God, you know, in Matthew, the Father, Son, and Spirit, it's already mixed up. And the seven spirits are second. So the age of intensification has been at the very latest from the end of the first century. You know, you know what I'm talking about? The three eyes, the three stages. Some of the young ones might, might know, some of the new ones. Sometimes we talk about the full ministry of Christ in the New Testament in three stages. Stage of incarnation, which is he in his earthly ministry to accomplish redemption. And then the stage of inclusion, where then he goes in the cross, not only death, resurrection, he becomes the life-giving spirit. And he accomplishes so much as the life-giving spirit. But then in the book of Revelation, we see he's not just the life-giving spirit. He is the seven spirits. And that doesn't mean that now there are seven spirits floating around. It's, it's, it's like the way we have a, a lamp that you go bright, brighter, brightest, you know. But this is with seven. And I never saw this with seven. One, brighter, 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 brighter. But that's the spirit today, is intensified. So everything the spirit does, he comforts, he enlightens, right? So many, he liberates in, in, in 2 Corinthians 3. But today he liberates, he liberates sevenfold intensified. So the things that would hold us before, That's why, I, I'm think, I've never thought of this, but that's why a 13-year-old boy could say to the Lord, never again, and live for the rest of the, his life because the spirit is intensified. That's not just willpower. That's the spirit power. But the spirit life power. Oh, dear saints, we could grow faster. We can grow faster. Do you see the farmer? Actually, I have two primary burdens in this outline. The first is this. He's a farmer with the seed. But so much is in the seed. Trust the seed. Trust the seed. Okay, point C. Let's read point C together. We're still in Roman 1, right? I better go a little faster. But let's read C together. This is amazing. Read the statement, please. If we pray, Lord, come back quickly, the Lord may say, while you are awaiting my coming back, I am awaiting your maturity. Only your maturity can hasten my coming back. So we say, Lord, we're waiting for you. Come back quickly. And he's saying, grow faster. Because I can't come unless you grow, not just grow, unless you mature. Somebody's got to mature. So we say, Lord, we're waiting for you. He said, I'm waiting for you to grow. He said, but Lord, I can't grow because my son is sick and my, bro my husband lost his job and this and that. And the other. He said, no, I sent all those things to you so that you would grow faster. Amen. You misunderstood. Then you go, oh, now I get it. Thank the Lord for the sevenfold spirit. I'll start growing now. Amen. While you're awaiting my coming back, I'm awaiting your maturity. Oh Lord, grow in us today. It is a great help for us to realize that if we are serious about awaiting the Lord's coming back, we need to grow in life unto maturity. Isn't it good to have this realization? We thought we're waiting for him. He's waiting for his people. 
But he's not waiting passively because he's sown himself as the seed of life into our hearts. And he's operating. To be mature, too, is to have Christ formed in us. Christ was born in us when we believed into him. He lives in us in our Christian life, and he will be formed in us at our maturity. This is Galatians 4, 419. My children with whom I travail again in birth until Christ is formed in you. You know, Paul used these, these words, travail, epiphras, epiphras, struggled. In Colossians he says, I struggle laboring according to his operation. It means it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy to grow, and it's not easy to help somebody else grow. It's a struggle. But Paul says, I struggle laboring according to his operation, which operates in me in power. So the Lord is operating in me to help you grow. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to remind us. I know this is not news to you. I'd like to remind us. You know, Peter, in his second epistle, I want to stir you up. I want to stir you up as a reminder. Peter said, I know my departure. When I'm not here, I want you to go on. So I want to stir you up for a reminder. So I want to remind us, one good way to grow is to try to help someone else grow. That's our experience. Then you won't be self-centered. Then your problems are actually not so big. And you, don't ha you have less time to think about your own problems. Because you're concerned for others. So just take care of others. And the, it's just this way. You take care of others, the Lord is faithful to take care of you. The Lord will give you the supply to take care of your situation. You don't have to spend that much time praying for your things. Say, Lord, you know about this and this, but you pray for that one and the other one and the other one and the other place and the other locality, the other country. When we're focused on others, actually, that helps us grow because we're one with the Lord. He's happy. He's happy in us that we're concerned for his interests on, on, on the earth. One says the last stage of transformation is maturity, the fullness of life. God's eternal purpose can be accomplished only through our transformation and maturity. B, maturity is a matter of having the divine life imparted into us again and again until we have the fullness of life. Do you, do you see how often this outline talks about maturity? Have you prayed for maturity? Some saints never pray for maturity. They only pray to grow. But we should, this should be in our concept. Lord, I want to grow to be mature. You know, with our children, many of you have children. You don't want them just to grow. You want them to grow unto maturity. If they don't mature, by the time they're even a teenager, they should have some maturity. If not, you're troubled. If you're 15, but you still act like a four-year-old, that's troubling. We should pray for maturity and pray for others to be mature. Brothers, we should pray for maturity and pray for each other's maturity. Pray for the maturity of all the leading ones. That they would have the constant dispensing of life, to have the fullness of life. So we should pray for growth and transformation and maturity. Maturity it's a matter of the enlargement of capacity, this point too. You know, when even our children, you know, our children, as they grow up, even they're very small, but their capacity enlarges. You know, we have five grandchildren, ages seven to two. Seven, 
seven, six, five, three, two. There's no, right, there's, we skip one. Seven, six, five, three, two. And so the big one uh, is our oldest. Her name is Daniela. Uh, she decides she wants to bake something. She wants to bake something. And she, she knows where things are now. Her mommy taught her. It was our, our baby, right, our, our youngest. That's her oldest, yeah. And so, and so, now there, you know, she, she can't go to the, you know, get the car, go to the store and buy ingredients yet, not, no. But sh she actually can get the pan, put the thing, mommy, because mommy is the one who, you know, turns on the stove. So she, she's not allowed to do that. But she can, she can actually do a lot. Her capacity is growing. That's normal with us. We shouldn't be the same. Five years after we got saved. Ten years after we got saved. Oh, this is a trick of the enemy. He lies to us. False humility. Oh, oh, I'm so, you know, and oh yeah, I don't know so much. I don't know. Uh, uh, dear saint, that's not normal. You're trying to be humble. But your humility is immaturity. I don't mean you should be proud. But if you're at the same stage that you were five years ago in the Lord, that's not a healthy thing. This is not to condemn anyone. This is for aspiration. Lord, grow in me. And grow normally. And maturity is a relative matter. It's a relative matter. You're kind of mature and in some areas of your life. But someone is a little more mature, someone's a little less mature, but we can all grow more. <clears throat> a, okay, uh, here we come to the other major point. 2A, maturity in life is the sum total of receiving the discipline of the Holy Spirit. The Lord will send things our way to discipline us, not to punish us. It's a big difference. Whether, whether a child obeys or doesn't, I mean, not obeys, whether a child is naughty or not, they need discipline. Whether they make mistakes or not, they need discipline. Whether they lie or not, they still need discipline. It could be the best, most well-behaved child, but they need discipline. They need training to grow up to be a proper, normal, contributing member of society, proper human being. As a believer, as a believer, we need discipline. And here we have verses in Hebrews, Hebrews 12. And you have completely forgotten the exhortation which reasons with you as with sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor nor faint when we prove by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. So I think we have in the next, uh, uh, where is it? Lord, let, let me keep reading the points and then I'll come back to Hebrews. Point B, others may see a person who has matured in life, but they cannot see the accumulated discipline of the Holy Spirit which that person has received secretly, day by day, throughout the years. Three says, God will sovereignly use persons, things, and events to empty us of everything that has filled us and to take away every preoccupation so that we may have an increased capacity to be filled with God. We don't know ourselves, but we have the wayside, we have stones, we have rocks, we have thorns, and the Lord in his sovereignty and love will allow things to happen in our lives out of love. I hope we can see this. Out of love. Out of love. He will put you with that certain brother in the church life. 
or that certain sister. You can get through with everyone except them. Our, I think our church life, this is the story of our church life. The Lord yokes us with people. There's no way around it except to pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, why this one? Why this one? But the Lord, the Lord is just there smiling. It's because I love you. I love you so much. Here's another one. <laughs> he does it. I'm surrounded by brothers that if we were not in the Lord, there's no way I would pick these men to be my friends. There's no way. We're just not. They're, they're, they just don't match me in that way. But the Lord put us together for 40 years. <laughs> Two brothers for 40, another one for 15. And here we are. And we're all happy. And we love one another. How about that? Just love one another. But naturally, no, I would not pick these guys. They don't know sports the way I do. They don't, no, no, I wouldn't. There's so many things. Anyway, but the Lord put us together. That was his love. And I got trained, at least some. I know I needed more. I know that. But I, I'm afraid if you ask them, they, they, they'd feel, oh, this guy. They would, ne they would never have picked me. So I know I'm as much of suffering to them even more. <laughs> but sorry. God, what, sovereign, there's a word sovereign here. Sovereign, sovereignly here for you. Oh, dear saints, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. The son, let's come back to the son. The son is supposed to help you grow. We need the hot situations. So that could be, it could be opposition. And some of us, some of us, even from relatives, they don't agree. They just don't agree with our way. You spend so much time with those church people. And we want to honor them. We genuinely love them. It's a suffering to us. It's a suffering to, to have that with people you love the most. And they don't understand you. That's a suffering. But it could also be coworkers, others who attack. You're a Christian? They, they just have it out for us just because we're a Christian. Some of us are at workplaces like that. They hate you because you're a Christian. You could be anything, do anything. You never did anything to them. They just, and you know it's not them. See, the enemy is behind, behind. But it could be situations related to our health we can't avoid. And the Lord allows. And sometimes, saints, sometimes we pray wrongly because we're too sentimental and natural. If a brother, something happens, <gasps> so drastic, right away we pray, oh Lord, bind your enemy and, and, and release our brother. Well, well, maybe we should inquire. Lord, what is your will in this situation? Because our brother's in your hand, so that happens sovereignly. Is this the attack of the enemy, Lord? If it is the attack of the enemy, we're ready to bind him. But Lord, if under your sovereignty, in your economy, you want to gain something in our brother deeper than you ever have in his life, go on, Lord, and we stand with you. But Lord, don't let the enemy have any ground. Shorten the time. Shorten the time. Don't let his family lose heart. Don't let his family have seeds of doubt. Lord, gain them in this situation. Now, there are times the Lord may lead us. Lord, heal our brother. But don't jump to that. Don't jump to that. 
jump to God's economy. Say, so, Lord, what are you doing? How are you furthering your economy in this situation? What is your will in this book, How to Enjoy God and How to Practice the Enjoyment of God? He probably has this example under this title, Inquiring, Beholding and Inquiring, you know, Psalm 27. A brother, sick. A sister prays right away. And Brother Lee says, why does the sister even think that God will, will heal her husband? You don't know. You have to pray, inquire. Lord, what is your will? What is your will? Lord, gain me, gain him, gain our children. Whatever your will is, I'm one with it. And now, if the enemy is here, Lord, I'm ready to bind. But we should have the view of God's economy. And the Lord, things we don't understand. And there are things that happen to the saints I, I don't understand. And in my secret, in my room, I will even say, Lord, I almost think it's not fair. But you know. My sentiment is that, Lord, this is too much for her. But Lord, she's your child. She's your daughter. So you know. And I trust you because we have enough history, Lord, that I know you are never wrong. And I hope, I hope we all can reach that stage. And I know not all of us are there. Where we, where we can say, Lord, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. But you are never wrong. That would be a strengthening to your Christian life. He'll use these things, it says, to take away every preoccupation. Luke, the verses, Luke one fifty three. The hungry he has filled with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. You could say it this way. The empty he has filled with good things, and the full he has sent away empty. Because we, we get filled with things, even sports, which means nothing. But it, we get filled with sports. We get filled with working out, even. We get, oh, we certainly get filled with our children. And now I know grandchildren. We, we occupied, and they become our world. And no, of course, normal life, we said this yesterday, surely we have. You have to have, take care of your children, your family. But you could do that. Not fully preoccupied inside. And there's room for the dispensing. I think I may have told you in the past this example. I was in, uh, I was in high school. And uh, one of our serving saints, one of our serving, uh, serving couple, um, Moved to the apartment right above us, right above us. And uh, my bedroom was a little two-bedroom apartment for my parents and myself. And then this couple, they had a baby. They had a, a son, now they had a baby. Baby's room right above my room. And my mother, out of the goodness of her heart, she gifted... Sister Ada, a rocking chair. And they didn't have carpeting. So, and this little boy, the second one, he was difficult in the early months. I, I don't know if it was, col is it colic? Is that what you say? Colic, colicky. Oh, he would be up crying. At night. Then I, I, and I could hear her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. And, the, and oh, Lord Jesus. And then she would sing. 
she would sing. You know them. They were with us in Irvine. And, and she would sing sometimes. And I'd fall asleep. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if the, Danny fell asleep or not, if the baby fell asleep or not. But I know I'd fall asleep to her singing. Sometimes, sometimes, I just pray for her. Oh, Lord, Sister Ada. Oh, strengthen my sister. She's my serving one. She was one of our serving ones. And I pray, oh, Lord, strengthen Sister Ada. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, she is receiving the dispensing. That showed me something. That showed me. It doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing. You cannot, you cannot negate the dispensing. If you want, you, it's there. I mean, you think of Paul. Paul's in a prison. Paul's in prison. And he was receiving the dispensing. He was writing these letters <laughs> in a chain. Your ambassador in a chain. <laughs> if it was me, I, I don't know if I'd be writing the church in Spokane a letter. I'd just be thinking, how do I get out of this chain? <laughs> that would be like preoccupying me. But Paul's like, you know, God's economy, so, so strengthen into the inner man, new man, warrior, and pray for me. Pray for me that I may speak with boldness as I ought to speak. Ambassador in a chain. So you actually cannot limit the dispensing. So we can grow in the midst of every situation. It's supposed to be the sun to help us grow. It's not intended to put, put us down. Okay, I'm going to jump to Roman 3. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. Oh, we need to read point C under this section. As, as used in the New Testament, the word mature, are you with me? The word mature refers to the believers being full-grown, mature, and perfected in the life of God, which they received at the time of regeneration. We should never be content with ourselves, but should pursue growth and maturity in the life of Christ. We need to go on to be brought on to maturity by forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before, pursuing toward the fullest enjoyment and gaining of Christ for the uttermost enjoyment of Christ in the millennial kingdom. And I have a note here in 394. Let me then be always growing, never, never standing still. Roman 3, the goal of Paul's ministry was to present every man full grown in Christ for the one new man. The Greek word rendered full grown in 128 may also be translated per perfect, complete, or mature. Paul's ministry was to dispense Christ into others so that they would be perfect and complete by maturing in Christ unto the full growth. Our uh, point um, C, uh, D, D, skip one. Our goal in preaching the gospel to sinners and in fellowshipping with the saints is to minister Christ into them so that they may mature in life and be presented full grown in Christ. And I want to say again, to grow, it helps to help others grow. To present them full grown, it, it helps us. To be ready for rapture, we need the maturity of life. The rapture is the consummating step of God's full salvation in life, the transfiguration, the redemption of our body. And one says, because of the demand of the divine life, that we have received, and because of the intensity of our love toward the Lord, we desire to pursue a life that awaits the Lord's coming. Then we have these verses, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the verses that I told you yesterday. At the end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about the Lord's coming to these new believers. So it talks here about the demand of the divine life. From the moment you receive the seed of life in you, there is something in us for the Lord's coming. Even the youngest, newest believer, it's normal to have a desire 
for the Lord's coming. Two says, as we love the Lord and await his coming, we hope to be raptured to the presence of the Lord. B, let's read B together. Amen. And this really summarizes the burden for today. To prepare ourselves, we, uh, sorry, uh, for the Lord's coming, we need to, one, prepare ourselves, love him, and grow in him. Marks of maturity included the following, point C, being filled with the divine life that changes us, reigning in life, being able to eat solid food, being full grown in understanding, being perfect in our heavenly as our heavenly Father is perfect, and seeing the body, knowing the body, living in the body, and for the body, caring for the body, and not honoring the body. I just want to say maybe two minutes on reigning in life. Here we have Romans 5.17, but I want to mention the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. The last two chapters, Acts 27 and 8, if you're familiar with those two chapters. <laughs> There's no doctrine in those two chapters. You know what it talks about there? A shipwreck, and he ends up on this island, bitten by a snake. First they think he's a demon or a criminal because he escaped the shipwreck. You know, you know that story about the shipwreck? You know, he's going to Rome for, for his appeal. So he's a prisoner. And then the Lord, there's, there's a storm, and the Lord said, told him, don't worry, I have given you all of these 200 and something people. I've given them to you. So everybody's going to be safe. So they start throwing things out of the boat. You, you remember? And then, and then the, some of the, the sailors, they, they try to sneak out. And Paul says, if you let the sailors sneak out, he tells the Roman guards, if you let the sailors sneak out, we're all going to uh, you know, die because we need their skill. So then they stop them. And it's a, why is this the Bible? Why is this story in the Bible? Are we ever going to be in a shipwreck and go to this island, get bitten by a snake? Probably not. Well, maybe. I, I don't know. But one thing after another after another. Isn't this the Lord's servant? Isn't, isn't this the minister of the age at that time? Isn't this the one who completed the word of God? In Colossians 1. Why does God not give him a break? And, and, so, and so then they go to the shore. They swim to the shore. Some of them are on, on pieces of wood. And they get there. And so then the people on the, in the land, they treat them nice. And so everybody, you know, they have a fire. And, and Paul, he's doing his job. I'm like, I'm, you know, he's not just sitting around. I'm prisoner. But he's also getting wood for the fire. That touched me. Paul, you have to do that. But he's a, puts the fire. And then a snake comes out. Ah! And then all the natives, people there. Oh, look at that. He escaped the sea, but, but the gods did not let him go. He must be evil. And then Paul, so they're all waiting for him to, and then, and then Paul's fine. And then, they, oh, he must be a god. Oh. And what is this? They think he, and he says, no, 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 don't do that. And he share the gospel with them. Why is this the Bible? Just to show this, God's economy is for us to reign in life. And that doesn't mean an easy life. It just means a normal daily life. Now, I know shipwrecks, snakes, that's not normal. But that was Paul's life. That was like par for the course for Paul. <laughs> One thing after another, after another. And the Lord said, you know, if you look at the life of the Lord Jesus, it wasn't so easy. You look at the life of his servant, it's not easy. Why do we then expect we deserve better? If the Lord is too easy on us, we might not grow. Be careful. I'm not saying pray for problems. You don't have to pray for them. They're coming anyway. 
but have the realization, Lord, let me grow by sun and shower. Let me grow. How about, how about we sing the hymn again? 394, and then we open for sharing to the saints? Yeah. Let's sing 394. 394. 